Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, May 13th. Derek Van Riper, you know, Sarah's here with you. A fun day. We have new tools to discuss. StatCast releasing some bat speed and bat tracking, which is really exciting. We'll dig into how we might use that now that we have some new information at our disposal. Of course, we had the debut of Paul Skeens over the weekend, so we'll have a few takeaways from that. And we'll do what we usually do on Mondays. We'll dig into some players that were frequently added and dropped over the weekend. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're not watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Watch us live at 1 o'clock Eastern on Fridays. we got Trevor May on with us each and every week. You know, how's it going for you on this Monday? It's going good. It's going good. Uh, one more day of Little League uh, for the old eldest. They won. Uh, they had a big win. Uh, they didn't win that many games this year. So uh, winning in the playoffs is a big deal. Uh, and they get to play again today. And uh, so, you know, young Felix was happy on his way to school. Uh, and uh, we had uh, we had people over for for Mother's Day, um, ordered some Indian and uh, hung out in the backyard. So it was, it was a good, good weekend. Nice little weekend. Glad to hear it. Got the Discord link in the show description if you'd like to connect with other listeners of the show and with us. We're in there from time to time, probably more at uh, you know, weekday times than on weekends, but always there trying to help when we can. Let's start with Paul Skeens and some takeaways from his debut against the Cubs. It was one of those moments that uh, people were looking forward to uh, throughout the weekend. And I think in many ways, it was a it was a debut that delivered on a lot of the hype. It was not in that Strasburg 14 strikeout absurd level, but a some good of it, he got let down by his teammate a little bit. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like there was, there was some of that. Two of and those he, runs he could have, he could have escaped without scoring. Yeah. I, I think in terms of process, like the velo as advertised, the slider, you know, the splitter, the splinker in this case, those main three pitches were what we expected them to be. I came away thinking the splinker was actually his best pitch. Like I, by you know called strikes and whiffs, CSW percentage, that was the case in the debut at least. It's just such a, a funky pitch to try and hit because it's it's not quite Johan Duran's pitch, but it's in that family. It's like if a starter had it, it would be kind of like that by by Velo. So I came away pretty impressed, even though you know we didn't get the W, we didn't get the things that we we hoped for. Seven strikeouts in less than five innings. I think that's a big, big step in the right direction as well. Um, I'm curious what what you saw and and what the model actually spit out for Paul Skeens. Yeah. I mean, I, I was watching over my shoulder uh, as Felix and I were at his younger brother's uh, uh, little league game. So uh, we were on a little phone uh, huddled in the bleachers trying to watch Skeens. So I, it wasn't the best uh, viewing experience for super uh, nuanced takes, but I will say that he lives in a little area of nuance. That's kind of, it's impressive given that he throws a hundred, you know, there's, there's that meme where it's like, uh, uh, where's it like the, the, the troglodyte and then the, 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 like more refined human. And then the, 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 the really smart guy and the, the guy that being go fastball, go burr, you know, the guy in the middle goes, there's more important things than fastball velocity. <laughs> and then the guy all the way on the other goes, fastball goes burr. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, he threw his a hundred that removes some of the nuance. He's going to be good. He sat. So I, I thought I'd go through some of the metrics and see where he sat. He sat with the third best velo in baseball out of 504 pitchers. If you listen to that number, 504 pitchers, you know that I did not cut anybody out of the sample. No, you did. I did not say starting pitchers. I did not say minimum one hundred. These are the games that I play when I when when we do want the leaderboard to look right. You know, I didn't do any of that. It's all pitchers, third best behind Duran and Mason Miller. <laughs> so uh, that's crazy. Um, where people start talking about the flaws is the other ranks. So. You know, when you look at his extension, 248 out of 504. So pretty much just just like right down the middle uh, for for extension. And then when you talk about uh, vertical movement, um, he does not do well there. Um, you know, he uh, let me just run it real quick because I was focused on horizontal movement is good. Uh, 13th out of 504 in horizontal movement. 
but we know that um, that vertical movement is more tied to to swing and miss, um, where uh, you know side to side movement. He's one hundred ninety sixth. Actually, this should be sorted the other way. Uh, <laughs> so if I sort the right way. Yeah. So he's like middle of the pack when it comes to vertical movement, which is bad. That's a dead zone. So when people start talking about Paul Skeens has bad fastball shape, what they're saying is that he's got a little bit of a lower release point that contributes to a sideways fastball that in a lot of ways looks like a sinker, even though it's called a four seam. And it doesn't have that riding component that leads to whiffs. But fastball goes burr, you know, <laughs> like it, it still goes really hard. And in doing this research uh, on his movement and where he ranked in these certain in these certain places, um, we figured out uh, an interesting comp. So the we're gonna play a video here real quick. And when you see uh, Paul Skeen's pitch, um, the the relevant things that he almost is a perfect match for on the pitch, per, per, the person behind him. So it's, it's going to be two pitchers in a row. He's a, almost a perfect match for them in terms of it is a perfect match on arm side movement. It's an almost perfect match on vertical movement. It's a, it's a four inch difference on release point um, and a five mile an hour difference now. <laughs> but when the other pitcher was younger, uh, it was closer. There's only one big difference. This is your clue because this is a little bit, a bit of like trivia. Who could you guess who the comp is? Because I was really surprised by this, but then once we started looking at the video, we're like, oh yeah, this is it. Um, the only difference is he's left handed. So mm -hmm. here we go. Paul Skeens is a right handed who play the tape. Boom, look at that. Hey. That is not what anyone expected to see. Because <laughs> when you threw Chris Sale's name at me as a Paul Skeens comp, I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean?" But it, again, it's by by movement, and you kind of the visual helps. If you're not watching us on YouTube, check out a clip. You need to watch fastballs in particular because you you kind of see that sweeping angular release across. And they're a little bit cross body ish. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's there's a few Lower similarities what they're point. doing with their, their legs coming out of their delivery. There's just a few things that you that are way more similar than you'd expect. And I think the, the main reason you, your brain doesn't come up with it on its own, like aside from throwing with different hands, is when you watch Chris Sale, he has such a skinny, tall, unusual body that you're kind of just watching how whippy he is. Yeah, he's a little Skeens, bit more herky jerky in his mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. And Skeens has a more prototypical starting pitcher body, right? Just bigger <laughs> shoulders, bigger lower half. Like it's just, so it doesn't, you're just watching different things at first. I, I, yeah. I couldn't believe it. But yeah, you're right. And the velo difference, even when Chris sailed through harder, there's still like a few kicks in Skeens' favor. It was 96, 97, 98, you know, in his, in his rookie years uh, for sale. And this is, this is above and beyond that. So, um, you know, Chris Sale is a guy that the stuff plus hasn't always loved. So that's, you know, that's an interesting thing. Then also the other part that the model might be missing and the model did, you know, spit out like a great number. Of course he would, but the model said his fastball had a one Oh one stuff. Plus that's what sort of encapsulates all the stuff we're talking about. That's above average. Cause four seams are around 97. So it's above average, but given that he throws a hundred, you expect it to be a much bigger number. Um, and then the splitter basically average as well. And if you, I can tell you why, when I look at the numbers is that the split finger only goes six miles an hour, uh, less uh, velo wise, it only goes six miles an hour uh, slower than the four seam. And it has almost the exact same, uh, horizontal movement. So the difference is all vertical. Um, and I think that to some level, the model is just saying, yeah, that's okay. You know, it's not a standout pitch. But maybe the raw velo component on the split finger, the fact that he's throwing at 95 um, is something that should be valued more. How many other pitches like that are in the database to be compared to? I mean, I think of Duran, you know, and so then it's going to say, well, even if you like Duran splitter or splink or whatever, Duran throws his like 99 because he's a reliever. Yeah, he's a reliever. <laughs> yeah. He'd probably throw it 96 if he was starting. Right, right. So I guess that, you know, there's another sort of uh, numbers-based comp is kind of like a, a starting John Duran. 
Those are good um, comps. Chris yeah. Sales had a very good career. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Anderhead's filthy. Like there's a really nice combination of, of of pitches to have, even if there are some things with the fastball that we'd like to see different. Until that fastball slows down several ticks, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a little bit of these discussions of like, oh, does Ryan Mountcastle, you know, have a terrible chase rate? And so therefore he's not good. Well, maybe when he's 30, it's a little bit more of a bigger deal. But right now it's not as big of a deal. (laughs) So like, am I buying that Skeens will be super dominant to 40? Maybe not. Maybe this will be a problem for him at some point. I don't think you can buy that for any pitcher. He's yeah, exactly. 21. Yeah. <laughs> Let's so. enjoy the next several years and then yeah. worry about what his velo does later when we get there. And I just think that's you know a problem that we we all tend to have sometimes is trying to project the entire future. It's like just just project the rest of this year. Think yeah. about maybe next year if you want to a little bit, but you don't have to go any further than that. Yeah, I think you know it is right to maybe wonder about um, his health, I guess. I mean, he throws a hundred all the time and he throws fairly close to his max and he throws his breaking balls hard and, you know, he throws his split finger hard. And so, yeah, it's fair to worry about that sort of stuff. But uh, at the same time, I'm just like, you know, the guys who throw 90s get hurt too. So just enjoy it while we can. Let's, yeah. let's, just, let's, let's have nice things while we're allowed to. 14 swings and misses. Yeah. Top five pitches by velocity, not surprisingly, all belong to Paul Skeens in that game at 101.1 up to 101.9. Just the don't range. look at his ERA too hard. Like, like I referenced, like that what happened was like maybe he hit a batter and walked a guy. And so he had two guys on base. And then the Pirates relievers, hey, not not good. No balloons. No balloons not not a good time for balloons. The Pirates relievers had a party of the bad sort, uh, <laughs> a walk party. I think it no. was uh, four straight walks after that. It was uh, w- there was like four bases loaded walks. So somebody they got the bases loaded, and then there was like four bases loaded walks that uh, that scored Skeens as runners and made it three you know three earned runs instead of one earned run. Uh, I feel like you could have almost left him in to finish and he and he would have finished with one earned run. That that's I thought he looked pretty dominant. Yeah, the other big number there, 84 pitches in the debut for Paul Skeen. So as far as how much they're letting him work, much more like a regular starter, which is kind of what they built up to given the the way they handled him earlier this year. But it might not be good in quality start leagues, I guess. It's kind of hard to get to six innings with 84. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's one one area where maybe he'll be a little underwhelming. But I think you know that with a lot of rookie pitchers going in. And even even if you had that concern, you know, a year ago with Grayson Rodriguez, by the second half of the season, I think those concerns were largely erased. I think you could see something similar. Maybe for this next month, it's a little more cautious with the usage. By the time you get to July, I think if he's pitching well, fix innings won't be a problem at all at that point in the season for Paul Skeens. Let's move on to some new tools, though. Bat speed leaderboards are here. You had a chance to dig in before it was released to the public. So you've had some time to let this sink in, see what was going to be out there, think about some ways we could actually utilize it. Um, just generally, you know, what have your initial impressions been of what StatCast has put out there? It's it's fun. Um, you know, one one thing that help, hurts us um, right now is just um, the ability to uh, parse this on a per pitch level. Um, you know, uh, pitch to pitch, uh, as opposed to uh, the way it is now is kind of um, grouped by player. So you can only kind of see the the entirety of a player's uh, you know averages and stuff. Um, we also just don't have any context year to year. So uh, we don't know what players were doing last year. Uh, it's it's year one. So I think the the overall thing that I would say is just we let's be cautious. Let's 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 dive into this. I'm sure there's signal here. I'm sure we will be able to be better analysts because of this. I'm sure there is there's stuff to say. And I think you know we'll get to this over the course of this pod. I think there are already some actionable things where you can pair on field results with some of the underlying numbers and, and, and learn something and pick 
I think you can pick your buy lows better with this. And we'll get to that. But obviously, uh, the number one thing is that, you know, you know, turning the bat faster uh, will lead to more power. Um, we have a, a an arrangement, a, a, a correlation here that's in the article, but um, I'm sharing with our, our viewers on YouTube. Um, it's a positive correlation. You'll see that there's a fair amount of noise, but if you look at the white dots, um, which are a bigger sample, um, they're mostly around this line that just goes up the more that you have, uh, you have more swing speed you have. But um, what what does end up happening? is that if you look, there's a correlation between how fast you turn the bat and swing length. And so the fastest bat in, in America, prepare for yourself to be really, really surprised, Giancarlo Stanton, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, that's not surprising. But he also, they have a stat called swing length, and Giancarlo Stanton is fourth in swing length behind J.D. Martinez, Brian Ramos, and Javier Baez. By the way, in a small sample for Brian Ramos to have below average bat speed and the second longest swing in baseball and not be striking out yet, but have strikeouts in his minor league um, numbers, that that's already saying something to me. You know, to have a bat that's almost a swing that's almost as long as Javier Baez is, is uh, suggests to me that you will have strikeout problems. Um, all the guys... Uh, most of the guys up up here at the top of the swing length, uh, Matt Carpenter, Stanton, um, uh, Baez, uh, Willie Adamas has a really long swing, Judge, Harris, Buxton, um, Nolan Arenado, Rowdy Telez, Reese Hoskins, Jordan Walker. Those are the longest swings in baseball. And, and it puts into focus some of their, their, um, their issues with strikeouts, I think. So... You know, one of the ways that I think that you you should think about this is think about swing length in tandem with bat speed. And uh, we have another visual here real quick that um, baseball's best hitters have short and fast swings. So now you're looking for the white dots. Those are the best batters. And if you look at the white dots, they have mostly above 72 mile an hour bat speed. 72 is average and mostly under a seven and a half uh, foot swing length. Those are the best hitters in baseball. And um, if you can hit both of those benchmarks and are struggling like a Corbin Carroll, then I'm in. So I think that's, I think that already you can say something interesting when you say, well, let me look at Carroll. Oh, look, he's got a 74.4 mile an hour bat speed. 72 is average. He's got a 7.1 uh, foot swing length that's better than average both of those things um, he has the same bat speed as Michael Harris and his swing is a foot shorter so to me that says I'm gonna buy low on Corbin Carroll this is a reason to buy low on Corbin Carroll the bat speed is not a problem the shoulder is not a problem you go to Arenado though and you go to Arenado he's got a 69.5 mile an hour bat speed which is 333rd if you have the the uh, numbers down real low, 333rd out of 460. It's worse if you uh, if you start looking among regulars. It's it's really bad. Um, and then his bat his bat swing length is 8.2 feet, which is really close to Stanton. So if he's got the swing length of a Stanton, but the swing speed of an Arias, that's a problem because Arias has the worst swing speed in baseball, but he has the shortest swing. So you can see that there's kind of a little bit of a relationship between power and contact that happens when you talk about swing length and swing speed. So we're all feeling it out, but already to me, those are two actual. Matt Chapman has above average bat speed and a quicker than average bat. I think he's about to get hot. So there's a ton of other information that needs to be like folded in to this type of analysis and being that this is still very new. I mean, day one for a lot of folks and like day eight for plenty of others, even that had mm -hmm. the advanced peak. I look at Arenado and then I see Mookie Betts in terms of bat speed, a few spots below, right? Big difference would be, well, hey, the swing length, Mookie Betts, 6.9. Arenado, 8.2. That gives you some difference. One thing that they're similar at, though, is a metric called fast swing rate. So those are swings that are at or above 75 miles per hour. And Arenado actually swings the bat 
hard a good bit of the time. He's got a 10.8% fast swing rate. So that gives me an idea that maybe a hitter could have the A swing and the B swing. And in the mm. case of Arenado, maybe there's still a little bit more raw there than the average would. Because think about how we use average exit velocity. We look at average exit velocity and we're like, in a vacuum, that doesn't yes. tell us much. Like with yeah. other contexts, it tells us something. But by itself, it doesn't tell us as much as we'd like it to. Yeah, yeah. We're early on to knowing, you know, which one of these things are predictive. Um, and and we can't we can't say for sure that any of them are. We can just look at the the sort of correlations between things. We we can say something like, uh, you know, I've I've got Alan Nathan quoted. He's a baseball physicist where he says that if you add a mile an hour bat speed, you effectively add six feet of bat ball distance. So like, there's like a physical like F equals ma. You know, like that. There's like a there's an actual uh, physical relationship between these things, but each batter gets to it in a different way, and and that makes that's super important. Um, there's a, a stat in here called squared up percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at Arias, you can spot Arias um, in terms of uh, you can spot him as having the quickest, like the shortest swing in baseball. And be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But Jung Hoon Lee does not have the shortest swing in baseball and he has more bat speed than Arias, but he has a kind of a rising game. Quan looks like Arias in terms of super short swing, no swing speed. Jung Lee has a little bit more swing speed. He also pulls the ball a little bit more than those two guys. And there's a, there's a link there that I have to discuss in a second. But if you just look at, at squared up percentage per swing and you start looking at people who have, um, you know, uh, a, a good amount of numbers there, it's Luis Arias, uh, Nolan Shanuel, um, Juan Soto. That's who, a weird leaderboard, man. Brian Ramos, who you mentioned earlier, is second in squared up by percentage swing that isn't been up that long. So but. here's my theory on squared up. Mm-hmm. It needs a lot more sample than this. And <laughs> you know what I think it is? It's like line drive rate. It's, I think this one's going to be the messiest of the stats. It's, I think it'll be useful in telling the t- picture of so far, but I don't know if it's going to tell you the picture of in the future, just like, does Juan Soto strike you as a, a, like he should be third to Arias and Shanuel? In squaring it up? Yeah. It uh, it makes a little bit of sense to me when I consider that Juan Soto probably swings harder than both of those guys on a pretty regular basis. Oh my God, by so much. He's right. So 76%. You know, that's what's absurd. To, is to swing that hard and to square it up is is just which silly. is I think is saying he's hot, <laughs> you know, like he's squaring it up. Like if you look at Matt Chapman. Him and Juan Soto have like the same stats in terms of bat speed and swing length. But Juan Soto has squared up 40% of the swings he's taken. He's squared them up. And Matt Chapman has squared up 19%. So basically half as many. And that's kind of the difference in these numbers between Matt Chapman and Juan Soto. So I think that those are noisy and I'm, 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 I, I look at them, but I don't know yet how much I want to use those. Um, and then the last part that I sort of alluded to uh, when it comes to pulling is that you have to think. So the way that they measure this is uh, bat speed is six inches from the head of the bat. So the sweet spot. That's a good idea. I think that makes sense. Uh, you want that part of the bat to be going the fastest. That's that's where you want to make contact. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunately, but the way that they're doing it is that they're measuring contact. They're measuring bat speed of contact or the closest point to contact on a miss. And so uh, for one, on contact, there's going to be a reduction in bat speed, a non-zero reduction in bat speed because you're making contact with the with the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has something to do with it. And then because you're measuring at contact, hitters who have a contact point out in front will have two things, a slightly longer swing length and slightly higher bat speed. But they may not inherently have more bat speed than somebody who lets the ball travel more. Right, because they're trying to do something different. And the bat just moves faster at different points in your swing. Mm -hmm. This is part of why people do want contact points out in front and why pull pulled balls go further. And you know, you're putting more bat speed on them. You're usually putting a little bit more launch angle on them because your bat's coming up at the end. Um, so that's complicated. I don't know if it's possible, 
but maybe at some point we, or maybe teams have something that's like six what is bat speed and the attack angle and swing length from six inches in front of their front their front knee or three inches in front of their front knee uh, because then you would have it be stabilized for every of them for all of them and you'd have this one metric that kind of judges them irregardless of their contact point sort of taking the contact point out of it because i do think contact point is something that hitters can change it, it you you become more aggressive you try to get that ball out in front or you try to let it travel that's like a that's like an approach decision but that's underlying a lot of these numbers i think the the next thing to look at here, which kind of working left to right across the screen for the new leaderboard, we have blasts. And just by name, blast to me sound like barrels. <laughs> so are blasts as helpful as barrels based on what we know so far? Is that like I look at that leaderboard, I'm like, um, probably not quite, but it looks better than the squared up when you look at the the blast by percentage of swings. Like you see a group of players. It adds a component of bat speed that squares that squared up does not. Right. So that's that seems like where you know, squared up might be like the launch angle leaderboard or the sweet spot leaderboard. Like sweet spot's good, but you got to hit the ball hard in the sweet spot. That's that's what the barrel is, right? So I think that's kind of where I like the blast. That's something if I was going to glance at one of those two columns, the blast on a per, per percentage swing basis would be the thing I'd look at. Yeah, and what's interesting about blast is that it it underlies this point. Like we were, we have average uh, bat speed on here, and um. So the bat speed varies a lot, even within a hitter. So their example is that Otani has uh, this home run that's a blast because his bat speed was 82.8. Nobody averages 82.8 in our thing. Um, And then there's another pit. There's another one where uh, his bat speed was only 80, and it doesn't count as a blast. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's this variance within uh, within players. But, um, you know, bat blasts per swing. Uh, the leaderboard is Luis Robert Jr., Ryan McKenna. Um, maybe you have to up this and get more competitive swings in your sample. If you do, uh, you start talking about William Contreras, Juan Soto, Ryan O'Hearn, Shohei Otani, Giancarlo Stanton, Yandy Diaz, Salvador Perez, Alec Bohm, Kyle Tucker, Trevor Larnick, Tyler Stevenson. And if you look over at the barrel leaderboard, Tyler Stevenson has a huge increase in barrel rate and his batting average hasn't caught up yet. We have another buy low. I think Tyler Stevenson is a rock solid buy low for me. Yeah. I, I think that's sort of the the main thing people want to know is like, okay, so you, you take what you have from these leaderboards and your initial thoughts about what using these numbers and working with other things we have, like what it all means together. Who do you target? Who are you going to go after? Because there's there's like one layer. There's the people that play in leagues with nobody else who read stuff like the stuff you write or listens to shows like ours, and they can go get these guys we're going to talk about. So we'll do that first. And then there's the second level where you have to come up with something that's a little bit different than everybody else. You have to look at it and say, hey, maybe reduced bat speed is the sign of a player not being healthy. And if there are players that are low and they weren't healthy to begin the season, Perhaps they're going to be healthy now. I can mm. actually target players that are coming up as. You know, I liked your thing about Arnado because I was like pretty much on board with I'm not buying low, but it's interesting to see that he is still swinging the bat 10% of the time over 75, mm-hmm. which is that's a, that's a decent amount of bat speed that, you know, if he connects on those, they're homers. Right. But let's start with the simple approach, right? You're not playing against 11 people like yourself in this scenario. You're playing against, you know, just a group of people that are pretty typical playing fantasy baseball. Who are your targets based on looking at some of these numbers? Well, one thing that I, uh, I didn't get to. So Larnock is an interesting one where you can just pick him up uh, in some places. So blasts are interesting in that way that you can kind of, and I, what I recommend is, is leaving the um, minimum total swings low. Um, I have 10 on right now as my default. But taking an eye, uh, keeping an eye on competitive swings. So, like the fact that Brian Ramos in 31 competitive swings has a good blast rate, I, I'm not sure that's good enough. But it is something to think about, given the other flaws in his game. That maybe there is, maybe he can, maybe he does have like real power in there. Um, but when I look at somebody like Lars Newtbar 
and I say, okay, 72.2 miles an hour uh, on the bat speed. Okay. So that's not a problem at least. So you, you look, I would say it's like, take a buy low hitter that you're interested in and then look at them and see if there's like a real problem that you can discover, you know? And for Newt I can't find it because 72.2 is enough bat speed. His swing length 6.8 is very short, you know? And yes, he's been having a little bit of trouble pulling the ball, but he knows about it and he's trying to change that contact point. His blast rate is good. I think Lars Nootbaar is a rock solid uh, buy low. You've always loved Lars Nootbaar, but it's good <laughs> to have more validation. I I do think uh, there was a player we were talking about before this that um, is makes it very hard to do this analysis, and his name is Isak Paredes. Mm-hmm. And for what it's worth, he is he, he's living rent free in our heads. Like we, we he's on our word cloud for sure. <laughs> I don't know. Isaac Perez is up there with, uh, I don't know, who do, who have we talked about as much as Isaac Perez and Lars Newbar made? Mitch Keller for the first few years of the Mitch show Keller. was number one. <laughs> Paredes is starting to make up some ground on him. So Paredes has a 67.6 mile an hour bat speed, and I think that is a problem. And just to give you some comps based on bat speed alone, he's hanging out with Alex Verdugo, Andres Jimenez, Gio Oshella, Jeff McNeil, Nick Ahmed, and the problem is all those guys that I mentioned have at least have short swings. Alex Verdugo is a 6.3 foot swing. Isak Paredes has an eight foot swing. That's like, it's, it's two, two feet longer than Alex Verdugo's swing and the same bat speed. Like, I think that's a, a little bit problematic, but as we pointed out earlier, uh, Isak Paredes is a major pull guy. Right. And so, I, I just, I don't know what the number is. I think I would say that my guess, and I, I'm trying to remember this, I would guess that the difference between letting the ball travel really like a, a opposite field spray ball really um, uh, contact point and then beginning the ball out in front, I would say the inches difference is about six to eight inches. So I don't think that the full difference in swing length between Verdugo and Paredes is explained by contact point alone. So I would say that this is a little bit of evidence that Paredes' approach is on shaky ground. Now, does that mean I want to sell high on him for this year? Not necessarily. But does that mean that I may not value him as much as the auction calculator says I should next year? (laughs) Maybe. It just seems like a very fragile approach that depends on getting the ball out in front with a long swing. It, 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 It leads to guessing, don't you think? But what if he's, what if he's good at anticipating? Positive guessing's negative. Anticipating know, yeah. is positive. We, we talked about this, this the difference in nomenclature. Yeah, because Isak Paredes has had very good plate skills. As as a prospect, he was always believed to have an above average, even a very good hit tool. Yeah, and strikeout that, rates have been fine. The swing strike rates have been fine. Right. So if his ability to you know, read pitches, anticipate pitches is above average or possibly elite. I feel like that's kind of your, how do you get there sort of explanation. And I think it's just yet another tool that doesn't like Isak Paredes. That's going to keep his value in check, no matter what the actual results say. He's got eight homers in 38 games. So he's on pace for another high twenties, low thirties home run season. He's doing it with a better average in OBP than last year so far. I don't think he's the kind of guy that can run a better Babbitt because the way he hits the ball lends itself to him being a low Babbitt player. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where the extra juice is coming from. But from a power perspective, he's doing everything in his ability right now to show us that the breakout from last year is actually somewhat sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's fascinating. Um, I I think on some level you like, we want to, we want to maybe do uh teams let's do yes oh you want to see teams i haven't done this tab yet which is to my detriment but you know you're trying to get a piece out there um let's see what tampa does i'm i'm just assuming they're going to be in some weird spot on this graph where are they no i don't want i want bat speed versus bat length that's what i want is this going to be a thing where because of the different combinations of hitters like you would end up with a generally like guys yeah are, they're are actually like clustered near one spot they're they're yeah they're mostly clustered near and tampa bay is actually doesn't stand out they have 
Um, they have shorter, they have longer than average um, swings and uh, less than average bat speed as a team. But there is, uh, there are some outliers. This is really interesting. The Braves have the longest and fastest swings in baseball, and they don't even have Stanton on their team. Longest and fastest swings in baseball. Yeah. So they're trying to do that. The Pirates have the longest, uh, second longest swings in baseball and above average. Uh, no, the second fastest swings in baseball. The Pirates. Hmm. These and this is and Andy Haynes is quoted extensively in my article saying it's not all about bat speed. <laughs> they had the second fastest average bat speed and a slightly above average swing length. So the pirates on this process level look pretty good. And the Orioles, and this is, uh, I think actually a, a, a due to scouting and player development from what I've heard is that the Orioles basically scout for contact ability um, and some, some, some sense of VBA, but also hit tool. They scout for hit tool, and then they make weighted bats part of the everyday program in the minor leagues so that everybody coming up through the minor leagues is basically just doing bat speed training. Guess what? The Orioles have the third fastest bats as a team and the third shortest swing length. Hmm. They really stand out as doing the right things. So love the Orioles for merging scouting and player development in such a fascinating and strong way. And if you consider that, then it would be interesting to know that the slowest bats in baseball are on the Chicago White Sox. That's and not surprising. They do have the shortest swing length, but the two teams with super slow bat speed are the Blue Jays and White Sox. Blue Jays, I think that there might be a component of some aging factors there. I mean, you, you, you look at some of their guys are getting older. Uh, like think about Springer in particular. Um, but uh, the fact that they're down there, I don't think is, is great news, but at least their swings are short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're not fast, but they're short. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Texas, who Donnie Ecker was quoted a lot in this piece, um, has a, has a have quick bats have short swing length uh, and near average bat speed. Um, one thing that I would guess. Oh, here's a, something that's actionable. If you want to look year to year, I found that the tightest relationship between bat speed and any outcome variable was with max EV, mm -hmm. and this is actually I think really important. We know from citing max EV and talking about it that it's not. And it's not one, it's not one of these like, oh, like he's gonna be great. You know, it's like one of those things. It describes raw power, but not every player gets to it. And we talk about that often, getting to that power and just describes their upside. So I think bat speed in some ways describes your upside. And then what we'll learn, it's a little bit like stuff plus. Like when you get a guy debut, you want to check his bat speed. But once you've had 150 plate appearances, then you only want to kind of know about bat speed differential year to year. And so you know that bat speed is tied to max EV. What you want to then do is go over to the, um, the year by year leaderboard uh, on Fangraphs. It's called the season stat grid. And you can put in, you know, 100 plate appearances this year. And uh, 400 last year, you can do year to year changes. Um, and you can look at who has changed the most in max EV. And what you'll find is that'll be a component of bat speed. So Fernando, T Fernando Tatis, his max EV being up three miles an hour, probably suggests that his bat is faster this year. Jake Cronenworth up one, bat is probably faster this year. When you look at the other side, the negative, Acuna down seven. There could be something there. We also know from Max EV, though, that it's hard to know when you have enough sample. Um, so, but Nolan Arenado is on this. I would guess that Nolan Arenado's bat was faster last year. Um, and uh, there's so there's still still some guesswork to be done here for sure. But um, and, and contact point is just contact point is this like lurking underlying thing that it's just hard to know. It'd be nice, maybe. If, maybe they could give us contact point. Maybe. I mean, I'm nice sure. Thing. I'm, I'm sure, sure this will there. evolve and and 
change uh, a lot in the next couple of years. And I, I think we're going to see all sorts of fun trade offers that take place now in our leagues as a result of this, because people are going to come up with a few different conclusions from all of it. Like that's just that's natural with any sort of new newfangled toys. Uh, it's funny when you see names popping on leaderboards that you don't expect to. But, you know, the buy high, I wrote a little bit about trade targets and different players you should go after. Sometimes the buy high is actually the right sort of move because the person that has that player uh, has found money. They have excess. They found a player at a relatively low price and maybe they just need something else and they're comfortable kind of locking in a profit by trading a player away. The example of that's probably Joe Adele. Joe Adele. I was just right? looking at him. Yeah. <laughs> like you look at his name, like he's he's popping on here. Like the bat the bat speed looks fantastic. He's 15th in average bat speed. He, does he doesn't well. have that eight foot swing that, you know, kind of seems to be where the strikeout guys are. Morell has eight foot. Jordan Walker has eight foot swing. Miguel yeah. Sano has an eight foot swing. Joe Adele, 7.6. Contact quality is pretty good as far as the percentage of blasts and all that. Like it just, it, it's supported. He's, he's stealing bases. There's all, all sorts of things in the numbers that look really good for Joe Adele. I mean, the only thing he's really doing that he's always done that would kind of be the yellow flag would be chasing pitches outside the zone but he's doing enough good things where that doesn't really matter and you're starting to think that maybe some of this massive strikeout rate growth could actually be sustained so you got power you got speed uh maybe some people are looking at that seven for 12 mark on the base pass and saying he's not going to keep getting green lights I've got news for you. That team is brutal. They can and, let everybody and, run as and much they're as they also, want. And they've, they've decided from spring training, we pointed this out, that, that they're going to run this year. They're going to run anyway, and I just think they've got it's like nothing a Ron to Washington lose. Thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nothing to lose in Anaheim. So I think the more I look at Joe Adele and seeing where he is here, it's yet another reason to think about him as that possible buy-high sort of target that you still believe in to continue at a higher level than his current manager does. Yeah, and I think another thing that I like to do with these stats is um, use them to uncover really low cost, low risk decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've got Matt Wallner in a 20 team keeper league and he's got the second best bat speed in baseball and his swing length is a foot shorter than John Carlos Stanton's. Like we weren't probably going to drop him anyway, but this is like, okay. I'm not going to drop him. And, you know, if you're in a 15 team where it's a, he's out there on the wire and you're just dropping, you know, a hurt reliever or something, you know, like if it's not a big deal, then maybe, maybe use it, you know? Uh, for example, I traded in auto new, I traded uh, for Jesus Sanchez. I didn't give up much. Some people might be surprised. I did give up, I gave up JP Sears, but I just, Fair. I had a lot of pitchers and pitchers for hitting is I'll do it anytime. And, you know, you might be like, well, Sanchez, why, who cares about Sanchez? Well, Sanchez has the same bat speed and swing length as Gunnar Henderson. He even squares up at a similar rate as Gunnar Henderson and has a similar amount of blasts. The problem is he's setting everything to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to know that he thinks he knows that's a problem. He's all. I mean, Jesus Sanchez also is running a little bit for the first time ever, and he's not slow. I know. So, like, I see when I when you see somebody like that, you're like, okay, he has the raw materials for a good swing. He must know there's a problem because he's hit for more power and more fly balls in the, in the past. So that seems like a toggle you can do. That's a little bit an easier toggle than maybe Arenado being like, "Yo, just swing faster, dude." <laughs> you know, like oh, maybe that's not possible at his age. So Jesus Sanchez is somebody that has has jumped off the page for me as um, somebody that is acquirable everywhere. Uh, yeah. If you're looking for a reason to be excited about Helio, Elliot Ramos, um, he has a, a similar uh, uh, bat speed to Matt Chapman, which is in the top 10 if you relax the, the numbers, the requirements. Um, and he has a shorter 7.5 foot swing. It's not, it's maybe not going to strike out as much as people think. So could he strike out 28% of the time and have an ISO over 200? Maybe. Hmm. So, but I'm not saying, you know, spend a lot to get Ramos. I'm saying if you have an extra spot, like why not pick up Hilary Ramos, you know? So I was thinking about looking at this leaderboard or these leaderboards and trying to find really good players who don't pop. 
because that might be mm-hmm. instructive of ways we could the, use the things parade incorrectly. Comps, right? <laughs> parade is comps. So they get, I mentioned Mookie Betts, right? I, I think Mookie Betts being where he is. Will Smith right there with Mookie Betts. 68.8 for average bat speed, slow. Fast swing rate is less than half of what Mookie has. I mean, that's kind of surprising, right? Like, how does that work? Why does that work? I think trying to answer those questions is going to have a lot of value because knowing how people have used the sliders on StatCast so far in their analysis, red, good, blue, bad, mm. like, that's that's where there's other opportunities. That's what I'm excited about. That's the lodum devil on my shoulder saying, hey, they're all looking for this. You should go look for that. So that's what I'm going to try and dig into that's, now that we've got more time with this. That's why I think swing length is huge. Because swing length, first of all, doesn't have the blue red on it. <laughs> and then very much if you if you just look at the bottom of average bat speed, you start to see these are shorter swing lengths, and that's what's keeping them in the big legs. So Luis Arias, again, worst bat speed in the majors, shortest bat, shortest swing length in the majors. But there are people like him, Justin Turner, um, it has really, really bad bat speed, but his swing length 6.4 is, is the same as Steven Kwan. Nice. And he's, you know, the difference for him is that his 6.4 is further out in front because he's a get out in front guy. So this is where the sort of relative, you should think about pull rate a little bit when you're looking at these. So if Justin Turner and Stephen Kwan have the same swing length, but Justin Bern- Turner is getting the ball out in front, Justin Turner's swing might be shorter than Seam Quan's in, in absolute terms. In any case, if you add just that toggle of swing length, you can find guys in the, the bottom, like Justin Turner, that are just getting to balls by being super, super short. And another name that's not necessarily someone who is established or anything, but Lamont Wade Jr. does not have great bat speed, but it's it's averageish. He has the eighth shortest swing in baseball. You know, so there's a kind of a reason to believe in Lamont Wade Jr. Yeah, I mean, there's a it's a good deep league sort of player, someone that you can make daily moves. He makes some sense. Yeah, the yeah. platoon aspect is not great. Yeah, a lot of these short, short swing guys work from the bottom. Arias, Bryce Terang, Austin Barnes, Alex Verdugo, Justin Turner. Justin Turner's a really good hitter. That kind of is like the how does he do it? Nice quick short swing. That's yeah. that's it. Madrigal, you know, Pedro Pajes, Victor Scott, Stephen Kwan. Wait, yeah, Pajes like has a really sweet. short swing? Pedro Pajes, the uh, uh, okay. like he's a catcher for the Cardinals. Yeah, and Andy Pajes. Hmm. No, oh, Nolan, Nolan Jones on here with a 6.8. Corey Seager with a 6.8. Nolan Jones is kind of interesting because there's some shallow leagues where he's been dropped. In the leagues where he's been held, even in keeper leagues, I think whoever has him is a little bit nervous based on what's happened to start the season so making a call average bat speed with a with a like uh short like the shortest 25 percent in baseball kind of swing length and a park that juices balls in play in a way where the thing that he'd be the worst at like average could be offset by his home park yeah so i'm still kind of into nolan jones since you know he's a rocky um yeah there's a ton of stuff to look at here. Why, geez, Wyatt Langford? I actually just traded for oh. Wyatt Langford in the keeper league. I had to give up a lot. That's to the do that it. was the name that that was the name I was saying on our on our cast. Yeah, goodness, six point eight feet for the swing, like seventy four mile per hour average bat speed. So yeah, short swing, very hard swing. And I saw some people posting about this more than one. I think posting that Wyatt Langford has been getting just absolutely wrecked on borderline calls so far getting the rookie treatment in the purest oh, yeah. sense. So you tell, you take that on top of an injury on top of his first month in the big leagues and how hard it is to hit big league pitching. It sure looks like bright days are, are still ahead for Wyatt Langford and maybe as soon as the second half of the season. Let me uh, try something real quick. Here is a uh, pit uh, swing length. So we're going to focus on swing length here, swing length, seven feet or, uh, or, or under, under seven feet. Um, and, uh, and above average bat speed, what we've got is, uh, Colton Kowser, Mitch Hanniger, Brian Reynolds, um, uh, Paul DeYoung. So every list is going to have one where you're like, hmm? uh, Paul DeYoung, Mookie Betts, uh, although he's, he's slightly below average bat speed. Um, 
Tommy Pham, Wyatt Langford, Cabrian Hayes, Heston Kerstad, Lars Newtbar, Nolan Jones, Corey Seager, Lane Thomas, Lamont Wade Jr. That's it. Did uh, it's Jose pretty good Abreu? List. So you have like it's all good, and then there's oh Jose Abreu. Yeah, Jose Abreu's on there, isn't he? He's right. He's on the cusp. He's yeah. got to be close because he's he's got the shorter swing. Yeah. Big average bat speed. Yeah. Hmm. That's problematic. <laughs> but any any good list uh, has. Um, oh, the reason I I went over him is uh, uh he didn't have quite the sample. I was trying to use a hundred competitive swings or better. Ah, uh, yeah. But um uh but any good list I think has I don't know who said this, but any good list is like mostly duh and then a little bit of what. Mm -hmm. and that list was mostly duh and a little bit of what and that little bit of what is you have to make a sort of decision on it you know you just that's where that's where you're going with your gut because we haven't vetted all these stats yet we're in the process of vetting these stats i want to know who's using them and using them incorrectly i got to figure that out that's the Mm -hmm. next thing to do in my league or using them in a way that i don't agree with because i don't don't know absolute right and wrong i would assume that the first the first salvo will just be sorting by bat speed and you know buying based on that without without the rest of the context right you're going to be looking at your auto new waiver wire and trey cabbage is going to (laughs) be getting put up for auction today yeah let's see let's see how many how many uh leagues trey cabbage was put up for auction today (laughs) this is like this is this is a totally niv Niv shock you're listening (laughs) tell us if uh there were a bunch of uh who else who else uh elliot dunn everyone's picking up oliver dunn and elliot ramos and trey cabbage yeah yeah, that and, and would be scenario. that would be a bat speed day. <laughs> yeah, bat speed day. Like Wednesday, all those players will be on new rosters on auto new as a result of <laughs> the stuff dropping. So uh, this is definitely an area we'll talk more about these leaderboards. We'll take questions, drop those questions in our Discord. We just, we're just scratching the surface. We're learning along the way, but I think it's something that'll be a lot of fun to continue digging into uh, throughout the season. Uh, we're going to move on to a few other topics. We'll keep these somewhat brief because the show is already like. 52 minutes long, but I want to talk about Robert Gasser, not because he's a brewer, but because he was actually the most sought after pitcher that was actually available since Skeens was already rostered pretty much everywhere in, in competitive leagues. And Gasser came up, pitched on Friday, debuted against the Cardinals, pitched well, wasn't overpowering. You know, it was four Ks, it was six scoreless innings, good results against the lineup that's really struggling to find its way. Uh, I think the big question we've had about Gasser is just. You know, what kind of command is he going to put around that arsenal? He's supposed to have above average command. We've seen the walk rate tick up at times. We understand that those are not necessarily the same thing. There's command, there's control. And I think what I see when I look at the scouting report is a fastball that was graded out poorly by fan graphs, a 40 grade fastball from Robert Gasser. And that's and- the number one thing that I look for in a debut in in the stuff plus model just if anybody's listening that wants to know that i look at fastball stuff plus almost more than the entire arsenal what i'm really surprised by is that you know there's a slider that's supposed to be above average a cutter that's supposed to be above average i don't think he was throwing the cutter much or at all it was it was fastball slider changeup it was almost all fastball slider only a couple mm-hmm. of changeups i wonder if this was a case where the game plan was simplified because it was a debut but 92.7 is the number I'm seeing as the average fastball velocity. We know it's not all velo. You know, if he had good ride, if he located it well, there's ways to get away with that. But that mix at that velo does seem a little bit weird given other things we know about Robert Gasser. Yeah, um, I went in on him. And this is my thinking. Yeah, I can see where they got this bad fastball grade on his four seam because he has poor ride on his four seam. He is a sinker guy. But, you know, at the same time, they're, you know, pretty good um, uh, numbers on in terms of scouting grades on on uh, his other p- uh, his other pieces. I think the changeup and the four seam were good enough um, for me to kind of jump in on him as someone who's going to be really good against righties. The, the sinker stuff plus was 102. Um, and the uh, the slider is 121. So I think he's going to be dominant against righties. 
It's a little bit like the uh, Michael King package where you're hoping the four seam and the changeup are good enough to exist against lefties. Uh, it's the other way around because he's the lefty, right? Yeah. He's going to be lefty. dominant against lefties. Ooh, that's not as good. Dominant against the lefties, but the other parts of the package, I think, will be good enough to, to keep him afloat against righties. Um, and then uh, there was a component of, like, well, at least his next start is against the Pirates. So sometimes when you, like, you see this, you're like, okay, I see some good things. The schedule is going to help me to give him a soft landing. I will at least want to play him this week because there is a difference between spending – as I did, forty bucks and spending ten bucks. Ten bucks says I just want him for this next start. Forty bucks says I want him for beyond this. But what I'm trying to avoid is spending a hundred bucks. These are all out of a thousand. I don't want to spend a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks on a starter because that seems as if he is anything. You know, that might just end up being a ten dollar buy too. So in this case, I was like, I'm going to spend forty and fifty bucks because he's at least worth ten bucks. Right, he's at least he worth ten bucks. Mm -hmm. Start him against Pirates this week. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, I wanted the home start against the Pirates, and if he stays in the rotation, if he stays up, I assume he will because they've had a lot of trouble with injuries. That's already. the other part of the bet. At Miami is the next turn. Like that's a great landing spot for these first couple of starts. So at the very least, I'm taking a shot on these first two opportunities and then by then well. he might have made the argument that he's in the rotation and then at the very least i've got a guy that well maybe i don't want to start him in atlanta you know but i've still got a guy i want to keep on my roster so this is all sort of 15 teamish language in 12 teamish language i would say yeah pick him up for the for the pirate start but treat him more fungibly you know, for these after these next two starts, don't fall in love, maybe because there are some flaws. The four seam does not have good ride. We have yet to we don't know if the changeup is good enough uh, to to get righties out. Yeah, I think there's also like this from a number scouting perspective. There's something similar for me at least to Joe Ryan coming through the minor leagues. Ryan was more dominant overall in terms of his, but the strikeout, strikeout numbers rates. are amazing for Gasser in the minors. Yeah. It's just kind of like the results are, are such that you look at him and say, okay, like, yeah, maybe the fastball is not amazing, but it's good enough. It's like you said, it's a sinker. It's over a hundred. We don't even, a lot of, a lot of fastballs grade out a little bit below that. Oh yes. No sinker. The average sinker is like 94 stuff plus. So yeah. one or two is great. I, I think the, the unanswered question for me is just like, where is the cutter that was in the scouting report before? Is he going to bust that out? If he busts that out, then you say, oh, there's there's your thing he's going to throw to righties that's that going to be make better. Him effective in that split. It would be better if he had that. Was it was it sneaking around inside the sweeper uh, designation or maybe, you know, um, yeah, I don't I don't know where that was. That definitely it is funny that um, Fangraphs has a has a fifty five sixty on the cutter that wasn't there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we're going to see people waiting, at least from a prospect investment perspective, for guys like uh, Kate Horton, maybe Jackson Job, because of later in the year. I think those the bids on those players will be bigger when they come up, even though Gasser got up earlier than those guys. Because it yeah. seems like a lot of prospect circles, he was in that that next wave. Like, yeah, he's probably a starter, but he's not necessarily a frontline guy. I think generally, I just don't like the idea of blowing. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of my free agency budget on one player. Yeah, I went like five to 12, depending on the league size and, and needs. And in the league, was, I think it was Tout Wars Solds, where I put the 12 the 12 percent bid in. Nobody else was close to that. I wish we still had Victory, where you get the yeah, the, next, you the runner up one dollar more. Dollar. <laughs> yeah. I, I in this moment regret voting against Victory several years ago when that came up to a, a league wide <laughs> get, vote. <laughs> the chickens have come on to roost. I won uh, him forty seven to thirty seven, dropping Ben Brown mm. in the Great Fantasy Baseball Invitational, um, and then I also won him in Barf Bay Area. Broto fantasy. Yeah, that's that's what it's the <laughs> every time. Thanks, thanks Laura Michaels. <laughs> that's a large sense of humor in one acronym. Yeah. Uh I won him 56 to 41, dropping Tyler Alexander, who'd been a two-starter for me. So um that's it, it's pushing it, and I just you know blew 67 on Tyler Black. I kept Tyler Black on my roster for another week just because I was like, man, if I paid 60 bucks for Tyler Black, I'm not dropping him <laughs> in the next week. <laughs> I'm surprised he did. 
<laughs> I, I think you could be waiting longer than you want for that opportunity to come back around oh, for Tyler Black. It's it's an it's an opportunity afforded to me by the fact that I'm in first place. Yeah, it's a luxury stash. Yeah. As soon as things get hectic, he's gone. It's an but, eight cup holder stash. That is. <laughs> yeah, as long as I can, I will. <laughs> Our stroller has four. We only have one kid. <laughs> Is it one well, for each hand, the, kid, the coffee, and the beer dad? for each? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one for each parent, and then two for the kid in case he's left-handed, right-handed, or needs water, <laughs> juice. I, I don't know. Four cup holders on a one kid stroller seems pretty weird to me. Uh, do you think we're right much later than we expected to be about Abraham Toro? I'll have to tell you, he does not look good in the bat speed stuff. I yeah, took but a, he, he's I not took that kind of player. There. I know, but it's a it's it's longish too. Like it's not. I I I expected, having been watching him this year, that it'd be a short swing length and poor bat speed. It was poor bat speed, seventy miles an hour, um, which is not it's not bottom of the league. Um, but like he he profiles kind of like Chris Bryant in terms of bat speed and swing length. Yeah, and profiling as twenty twenty four Chris Bryant in that way is not a compliment. But I, I, also, I think there's. Yeah, I think there's there's analog analysis here. Like, how many yeah. times in Abraham Toro's career has he not had to look over his shoulder for playing time? Ah, uh, yeah, it's like one or two at most, and those were reasonably short stretches because of the teams he was on. Probably more with Seattle in 2022. Didn't really get a chance at all with the Brewers. Like that just didn't work out at all. And now he moves around enough. He's on a team that's flexible. The Oakland enough. A's and yeah. the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Last chance saloon. Yeah. And maybe a question for a future day. Should it be like, should players like this be fringe guys or are they good enough to be more than that? I think he's good enough. What's interesting is the projections are all at least league average bat wise or around there. Uh, Steamer is excited about him. Steamer says 250, 318, 399, 10% better than league average with a full season pace of. 16 homers and eight stolen bases, basically. That'll work. I, I just saw Toro get picked up a lot of places. I I think that I wanted- that's actually, you know, given any anything I said about bat speed or whatever, that's that's reasonable. That's in a reasonable expectation, and that's valuable in a lot of places. Um, and he should he should have his job because it's there's not really much competition for it. I looked at him as a replacement in places where I was rostering Tyler Freeman. That's kind of where I was looking. You moved at. on from Freeman? Yeah, but I might have just moved on to another version of Freeman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they are similar in a lot of respects, but Freeman is hitting 184 uh, on some poor luck. And I that's the that's the kind of analog analysis for me is that we've got a 346 Babbitt from Toro, and I've seen a lot of singles, you know. And what's missing from somebody like Freeman is a 193 Babbitt, and I haven't seen the singles but I've seen similar power out of both and similar contact. I just, if I had that choice between those two, I would take the one where I think that the luck would be even out in the right way going forward. It's fair. I, uh, I think with, with Toro, I'm just more comfortable at that playing time, even though you could see the luck kind of turning for Freeman. I still think they look at him as a little more of a super utility guy and I don't it know is, if he'll play every day. He's playing every day, but you're right. It hasn't been kind of a set it and forget it in center. In the last uh, 10 games, he's played second twice and th- and been a pinch hitter and played third. Yeah, I was going to look and see what's the most recent run been. Yeah, a couple, two, three, about three, three days out of the lineup in the last 11. So he's almost a full share and a mm. little lower in the order, too. That's the other thing that continues to hold Tyler Freeman back just slightly, but very similar in terms of what they are likely to bring to the table if they're playing equal amounts. Any other notable bids, players you were excited about? uh, It's just kind of amazing that we just were comparing these two guys. Just think back of the journey of Tyler Freeman and Abraham Toro Hernandez on this podcast. (laughs) Oh, they were both prospects of the week. (laughs) They definitely were both prospects of the week that I was super excited about at different points in my life and then completely forgot about them for like two years. (laughs) Just like just wiped them from my memory and didn't own them anywhere. And and now uh, in places where I wish I had 
Tyler Freeman that I actually could use him. I'm mad that somebody else has him. <laughs> I guess the thing that it also does give Freeman a little more path to value is that he steals some bases. I don't think Toro's offering much in that regard. He's one for two, one for two so far this season. Yeah, Freeman at least four there. for seven. He's taken off a handful more times. I think that that actually means something too. Uh, anybody else you picked up over the weekend that you thought uh, would end up being a good stick for more than just you know the upcoming week? Like streamers are one thing, but any any sneaky ads? I went a little uh, lodum during this uh, bat speed moment and went and got Andrew Vaughn, uh, who has actually a fairly you know it's an average length, but poor bat speed and i and i wasn't going to play him i just picked him up to stash him and just see if a, a week of rehabilitation is enough for me to care you know one of those dollar stashes at the bottom of a of, of a long string i don't really have anything to tell you uh that's good you picked up andrew vaughn that's um uh, i did <laughs> it's not as sad as me picking up victor robles <laughs> and I might have done that, except that he, I think he like came back and got hurt in the same game. He came back and made a pretty bad base running blunder. <laughs> that was, that was brought to our attention. He was trending for some people. I can't even believe <laughs> because that. Because it was such a bad blunder. Yeah. Yeah. He made an error. Oh, bad, bad, bad day at the office. But I, that's, um, to me, that was a tip of the cap buying into the small sample from Seeger, uh, Robert Orr's system that was looking at uh, hitting and robots I did, popping in there. I, I did pick up uh, other word cloud favorite Jack Zawinski uh, in my main event uh, just because in a similar way he's cheap. Mm -hmm. um, there's under the hood like he's making contact and you know I think he's going to move that contact point out in front and strike out a little bit more and hit for power again. So um, I'm just interested. I think that he's someone that uh, really encapsulates what we were talking about with where the contact point is. Uh, because right now he has a 7.2 foot swing length, which is would be among the shorter in baseball. Um, and of course, the 73 mile an hour bat speed. But maybe he should have a longer swing because mm -hmm. he should be getting the ball out in front more. So um, just an interesting guy that I want to have around for a little while longer because there's a lot of stuff that looks good other than the Babbitt. A couple of other things to get to real quick before we go. Frequently dropped players. Not a lot of surprises this week because I think there were some unfortunately obvious cuts like Wilson Contreras. We, I saw a 10-week timetable for his forearm injury. Mm -hmm. You really can't hold him without IL spots. Uh, Tyler Black was the second most dropped player <laughs> in the Rotowire Online Championship. Those are 12-team leagues, though. If it's deeper than that, you know, finding playing time is tough. I'm, I don't know how long I'll be able to hold on to him now. <laughs> yeah, injuries. But at least I only, you know, lasted 50 bucks and not 300. <laughs> That's true. Other injuries, though. I mean, Christian Encarnacion Strand, we talked about that late last week. He was a regular Hardly cut Hardy Cube, yeah. Brandon Drury uh, Edward Cabrera Kent Tomatoes on the IL with a virus but he's also not pitching well so I could see that being just like that last straw for a lot of people that had him rostered uh, Kevin Ginkle got dropped because Paul Seawald's back for the Diamondbacks Yoel Piamps getting dropped because Trevor McGill keeps getting saves for the Brewers McGill didn't have it as far as like A plus command on Saturday, but there was one of his outings last week where he was just dotting the edges of the zone. I was curious if he had made any gains as far as his uh, location numbers go, because I don't remember him from last year having command that was quite that good. Maybe I just caught him on one of those days where he felt great, but it looked really good. Yeah, he's definitely uh, advanced there. He has above average location plus, and he hadn't, he didn't have it before. He's also uh, like far and away the stuff plus favorite for that in that pen. Um, and I'm kicking myself now because we've cycled through basically every uh, Brewers closer on my main event team, and we ended up with Piams at the end, mm. um, which is so stupid. Because my model says that it should have been Trevor Mega like from the beginning. Um, and so now I just feel dumb. Sometimes you just need to argue uh, your position or, or believe in your in your model. And uh, this time I was like, well, Piams is getting the, the chances. So let's pick him up. I think if you're Ooh. disappointed that the K's haven't been there, they'll be there. It's, yeah. it's good enough stuff. It's not for Mega. Yeah, for Mega. Oh, it's, yeah. It, it, it's, it's coming. But uh, he, he looks like the guy until Devin Williams comes back. And then the question then becomes, once Williams is eventually gone, 
does McGill go back to getting saves in the future? I mean, he's one of those older debut guys a few years ago that isn't a free agent until after 2027. So he'll be around as long as he's healthy in high leverage spots for a long time. Yeah, I think if he loses his job again this year, it'll he'll regain it again in the future. So covered a lot on this show. If you want to read more, Eno actually has a piece about the new bat speed numbers. Actually, two, right? You got the one that you uh, wrote about Matt Chapman with uh, Andrew Baggerly, and then you've got the one that you wrote on your own, focusing on everything that's out there with some leaderboards, some awesome visuals. If you didn't watch on YouTube, you can check out those visuals in the story. Athletic.com slash rates and barrels will get you a subscription, so be sure to do that if you don't have a subscription already. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find the pod at rates and barrels. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Tuesday. Thanks for listening.